We are all together now. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here on a weekend. This is unheard of in Spain. So I'm extremely grateful for such a generous presence this afternoon, this morning. And so we're all here to actually present to you the participants in the round table to present Julia Foscari's incredible publication that you see here on the table called Antarctic Resolution. A few months ago, Spain's uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Teresa Ribera, and her Ministry of Ecological Transition asked the Tissen Mordemitsa Museum, National Museum, and TBA 21 to contribute to and collaborate with them on this incredible momentum of the 30th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol for Antarctica. So this has been an incredible honor and we're really, really very <laughs> happy to participate in such event. And I really want to thank Evelia Acevedo for making this possible, the director of the National Museum. So we're extremely honored to be invited to do so because it coincides perfectly with our mission to seek which seeks to foster collaborations between artistic research and creative work in the humanities and in the sciences in addressing the most pressing issues of our time. And the Antarctic urgency is none less but one of the most important. And on Monday, the day of the 30th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol, um, we will be honored to join this very high level conference organized by the Spanish government and the ministers of some 20 countries coming together here in Madrid to revisit this incredible protocol. And we're really delightful to participate in this very impactful day here at the museum. So today with me here, uh, several experts in the matter led by the researcher of this incredible project, Julia Foscari, Antarctic Resolution, and her foundation, Unless. And they will provide you with a far better insight than I could ever do on this subject. So I will be handing over to them very shortly. But first, I want to introduce you to Rémi Parmentier, an environmentalist of some notable reputation. I won't go into his whole history, but he's an extraordinary person, and we've been collaborating closely together uh, he's also responsible for the déroulé of the big conference starting on Monday. So we're very, very honored to have him here with us. And um, I'm very happy that he will co-facilitate co this event with me together. And today's event has been transmitted by internet on stage. So I'm sorry if these cameras get in your way. Um, but this is a stage is a digital platform which we've created to trigger awareness and through the work of artists and planetary um, about planetary emergencies. And the installation of the Antarctic Resolution, which will be, you've seen on your way in, will be here at the museum for another two weeks. Antarctica is not the only most precious thermostat we have on this planet to measure climate change and to, 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 for us to really strengthen our awareness on the importance of protecting our planet. It also represents an opportunity for governments, researchers, scientists, and indeed also the art world and the world of culture to come together to not only respect and renew our commitment to the Antarctic Resolution, but also to possibly further it, to serve as an example of what, could have, what was achieved 30 years ago, we can go further with. Um, I think it's so important that the world of art and culture step up to this challenge, not only in awareness raising, but also encouraging a transdisciplinary approach to solution finding. After all, isn't that what we all yearn for? Thank you very, very much for being here today. And I pass over the microphone to Rémi Parmentier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Contessa. Thank you, Contessa and Bonnie and Lisa. Uh, thank you to you, to TBA 21, and to the Christian uh, Bonnie and Lisa Museum for your very kind hospitality. It's always a, a real pleasure to collaborate with you. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, 
everyone uh, uh, has seen upstairs, uh, Juliana post post uh, installation, which is on, on display at the entrance of the museum, and public resolution based on the on the work, which is on the table here. It's, it's really a massive uh, piece of work, and I've been extremely impressed, not only when I spoke with you a few months ago, but when I finally received the work uh, a few weeks ago, and amazing. So uh, we very much look forward to uh, speaking with you. But before uh, I give you the floor, Julia, uh, and uh, uh, maybe I could ask Francesca. Uh, yes, the lady Francesca, uh, to explain uh, the relation uh, of TDA 21 with that book. Uh, but before we do so, uh, and, and you, you explain uh, briefly your, your association with the book, uh, I would like to introduce a lot of that theories, uh, that we have uh, around this. I was going to say around this table, well, for this round table. <laughs> um, so we have Pascal Dany, uh, former uh, director general of the uh, World Trade Organization, uh, president emeritus of the uh, Jacques Delors Institute, uh, based in, uh, in Brussels, and also co chair of Antarctica 2020. An international group of influencers uh, who are uh, promoting the uh, designation of, of marine protected areas in the uh, waters surrounding Antarctica. So, bonjour Pascal, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be hearing from you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, together with you, there, we have Jim Barnes, uh, who is the board chair and the founder. Of ASOC, the uh, Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, which you founded in 1978. Right. I remember very well because you came to Paris to see me and, and tell me, hey, we must save Antarctica. Uh, and um, you've been uh, ever since a key driver of Antarctic uh, conservation, uh, which um, uh, I think we, we, we can, it's fair to say that you are uh, certainly one of the fathers of the Madrid Protocol uh, 30 years ago, uh, Jim. So great to see you here in Madrid again. And we have Emil Dedieu, should I say Dedieu or Dedieu? 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 Uh, who is he? Uh, you're used to being... Uh, called Dédieu because you're based in Brussels yes. um, and um, you're the Brussels-based representative of the Pew Charitable Trusts, which is a large institution with an important marine conservation portfolio. So uh, thank you also for being here. And um, also in the room, we have a number of environmentalists, scientists uh, interested in these issues. Uh, some of you even I know has been in Antarctica. Uh, so uh, with time permitting, um, we will be uh, very keen to give you the floor and, and let you ask questions or comment. So Francesca, I know you're, uh, you, maybe you did not expect it, but tell us briefly, uh, you know, how your relation with Julia and with the book project. And TBA uh, 21. Thank you. Do you want me to stay? I'd stand up again? Um, well, Julia Foscari and I know each other for many years, and she works sometimes, and we're very good friends with her in, from Venice because TBA 21 also uh, has an organization called TBA 21 Academy, which is entirely focused on the ocean and um, has a wonderful space in Venice. So it's really Venice that brings us together, the director of which is Marcus Raymond uh, sitting here with us today. And um, also want to um, 
as you mentioned, uh, Jose Antonio de Olmo from the World Wildlife Fund here in Spain, and I'm very happy to hear see that you're here as well. Sorry, to answer your question, is um, Julia approached us about this publication, wanted some help um, in order to finish the publication. And um, at the same time, I fell in love with this installation that I saw at the Venice Biennial um, this summer. And so we decided to collaborate on this together. It's also the foundation really wants to support artistic research on this level. And I think this is a way of demonstrating how important the arts are in terms of facilitating projects like this. So thank you. Thank you, Francesca. And always impressed by uh, the work that you lead uh, with uh, TBA uh, 21. So uh, now, uh, Julia, um, as I said earlier, uh, your book is, is massive, but it's massively impressive too. Uh, and so please tell us, uh, how it became a reality. Oh, yeah, th thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you, Francesca, for the invitation to present Antarctic Resolution at the Museo Nacional Cristiano Bernita. It's, as you all know, I'm a novice on the Antarctic matters, especially sitting next to people who have devoted their lives to this cause. What we did try to do at the less in the past three years is to catalyze this such intelligence into a holistic and interdisciplinary research with the ambition of creating a high resolution image of a, of a continent, hence the title, which allows to broadcast knowledge on the global, on what is unquestionably a global commons. <coughs> the publication of Antarctic Resolution, which was actually authored by 150 world experts, broadly speaking from the fields of geopolitics, science and architecture, which include James Vines, which is sitting here by my side, um, actually is perhaps the first encyclopedic body of work which has the potential of heightened awareness on the pivotal role of the seventh continent and the southern ocean that surrounds it, holds in the global ecosystem. But Antarctic Resolution <coughs> aims to do more than that. Antarctic Resolution is for us a tool that we want to use it to, as, a, as a call for action uh, to launch a decisive resolution on Antarctica. An Antarctic, an Antarctic resolution that advocates to strengthen and extend well beyond 2048, the protocol on environmental protection um, to the Antarctic Treaty that was signed almost exactly 30 years ago here in Madrid on the 4th of October, 1991, as Francesca and you earlier mentioned. An Antarctic resolution that wants to ensure the protection of the Southern Ocean and the creation of a network of marine protected areas, which is the focus of some of my colleagues here at the site and we have, for which you have fought for your whole lives, but also an Antarctic resolution that advocates for the reduction of our anthropic, anthropic footprint on the continent um, and rejects the proliferation of embassy-like stations, which at, at present allow only for 13% of their surface areas devoted to scientific labs, and only one out of nine of their inhabitants are scientists. Obviously, there's a disciplinary focus on my side as I'm an architect too, Create sort of a first census of the inhabitation modes uh, which occurred in Antarctica in the past 200 years since our first step on the continent, which was recorded in 1821. But again, an Antarctic resolution that advocates for shared infrastructure, for the formation of international stations, and ideally even transnational stations, and really the sharing of international sort of scientific findings. And an Antarctic resolution which um, launches an open access platform which catalyzes knowledge uh, on the extreme building practices and enforce building standards, which at the moment are completely lacking on the continent, to lessen our contaminating footprint on the continent. So ultimately, Antarctic Resolution, which is a collective effort, so I'm very grateful when you mentioned my name in relation to the project, but it's a project by a less and endless number of people who believe in it, which are more than 300, over, but beyond, over and beyond the 150 authors, there's been archives, scientists, researchers, students all around the world which have contributed to this project. And that's its strength, that it is collective. So the, the, it is really to build upon the spirit of the so-called Madrid Protocol and ensure that a global commons, which is at once the largest repository of data on climate, on our climate history of our planet, which can inform environmental policies, which are urgent, and at the same time represent the largest menace to all coastal communities, which are threatened by the increase in the sea level due to anthropogenic global warming, to allow this global commons to be not only protected, but also managed and governed in the interest of humanity at large. 
this is really the ambition that fuels and less that fuels our team, that fuels, I'm sure, all of the advocates for Antarctic resolution and all the contributors to this project. And this is really the, the aim and the, and, the, and the agenda that we intend to pursue further with this project in the future. Thank you, uh, Julia. I like your passion. <laughs> uh, and the book, by the way, uh, of course you can through the installation in the hall, you can have a look at, at it and you can you know, see the different pages. But I think you can even buy it in the, in the bookstore of the museum. And for those of you who are online, there is a thing called Google. And uh, I'm sure you can find out uh, how you, you can buy it online uh, as well. It's, it's, it's really a remarkable piece of work. Uh, I should have mentioned uh, when I started that the Ministry for the Ecological Transition, which is organizing that conference uh, on Monday, to, uh, on the day of the uh, 30th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol, has uh, identified two hashtags for, uh, for the celebration. It's very simple. It's Antarctica and it's Madrid Protocol, uh, both depending on how you tweet, you can uh, use these as, at hashtags in, in Spanish, Antarctida, uh, Protocolo de Madrid, I suppose, and uh, uh, Madrid <coughs> Protocol Antarctica, because I see some of you are uh, obviously tweeting with your telephone, so I thought I should uh, mention it. Um, and um, it's very exciting that uh, uh, the Madrileños uh, and people visiting the museum uh, in the next two weeks will be able to uh, to see the installation in the uh, in the hall at the entrance of the museum. Uh, two weeks, so uh, come to the museum, be inspired by the installation, and be inspired by the book and by the work of Julia. So let's now uh, turn to uh, Jim Jim Barnes. Uh, you're featured in the book, right? Or you have a piece? I have a couple of pieces. You have a couple of pieces in the book, of course, as it, as it should be. Uh, so as I said, I, I've known you since uh, you started uh, ASOC, the Antarctic and Southern uh, Ocean Coalition in 1978. As I said, you came to see me in Paris and said, we must save Antarctica. And I said, whoa, whoa, I just got out of the Rainbow Warrior. I'm just trying to stop commercial <laughs> willing, but uh, you are very persistent and very passionate and uh, together with many colleagues, you know, we worked together and uh, as I said, I consider you and many people consider you as one of the fathers of the, of the Madrid Protocol. So, um, by the way, if you have never seen someone who can claim that he has protected uh, and, and saved an entire continent on Earth, this is your chance today. <laughs> I think he, he deserves an applause. <laughs> so, so um, Jim, tell us. Why you came back to Madrid 30 years later? Uh, you just arrived yesterday, right? Yeah. What are your expectations with the conference on Monday? Okay, well, thank you, Remy. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I am here. Uh, when I look back on the last 30 years or so of work, I think the Madrid Protocol is one of the highlights, not just of my life, but of many people's lives. Uh, and at the time, it was so far from a given that we were all written off. So when we first, when I say we, I'm thinking of all the member groups of ASOC. That includes Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund, <clears throat> Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, and dozens of others. And we had this idea going back to 1982 of having a world park Antarctica, we called. And the whole campaign that we mounted in the 1980s, which I'll mention in a minute, was all around that theme. Don't let miners and oil dr drillers and so forth into Antarctica. Control uh, fishers and so forth. And um, in 1983, um, uh, the governments who control Antarctic, uh, the Antarctic, which is 10% of the Earth, if you look at the continent, Southern Ocean, 
10%. The small group then, 13 countries, and they said, well, we want to go after oil and uh, minerals. So they spent seven years negotiating uh, what they call the Minerals Convention. And the NGOs, led by <clears throat> ASOC and Greenpeace and WWF and all the, all the other members, we followed them wherever they went around the world. They negotiate in Japan, we're in Japan. They negotiate wherever they went, Chile, wherever. And we also were trying to inform the global public about what was at stake. So what did we try? Well, the usual things. We tried a petition campaign. In those days, petitions were actual pieces of paper. People actually signed them. People actually wrote their names and addresses and stuff down. Eventually, we collected more than 10 million signatures around the world, which we could use in the way that you use petitions, but also connecting all the time to people. And so if you travel around the world uh, trying to highlight what the governments are doing behind closed doors, because we were never allowed in the room, um, it begins to uh, give a message and spread that message. So if we can be on the front page of the main dailies in Tokyo, because we're following that negotiation there and demonstrating, or in Germany, or in France, or in Chile, or in Argentina, or wherever we went, they went, um, that helped build this public momentum for a world park uh, campaign. So it was always a long shot, and we weren't therefore totally surprised when in 1988, <clears throat> these governments went ahead and said, well, we've done it. And they signed the Minerals Convention. And unfortunately, what I didn't think through at the time was, A, we would never give up, and B, <clears throat> they had to ratify that treaty. Every single country had to ratify it to keep the so-called consensus system going. Um, so we went to work again and redoubled our efforts and made uh, common cause with Jacques Cousteau, who was not an ASOC member, but a very important NGO, obviously, as you all know. And we became good friends and he <clears throat> helped enormously to raise public awareness around the world and particularly in France. Now, if you want to break a consensus, what do you do? You have to convince one or more countries to say, oh, I reflected on this minerals convention, and I don't really think that's the way to go. And that's what happened. France and Australia both turned their backs on it in 1989, and that broke the consensus. <clears throat> so then they came to us, and they said, oh, well, what next? And we said, ah, negotiate an environmental protection protocol for the Antarctic Treaty. Go a completely different direction. Uh, by the way, that protocol should have a permanent ban on mining and oil drilling and so forth. And um, right off the bat, uh, a majority of the countries, uh, including Spain to its credit, and obviously uh, France, which was a leader, and Belgium, and uh, Germany, and other states, Chile, Australia was a leader down there. But in powerful, important countries, including the US, England, and Russia said, no, we will never, ever agree to a permanent ban on oil and mining. And so that became another fight. And our campaign just kept going, rolling around the world. Again, they took several, two, two years to negotiate in four different countries. And finally, uh, the uh, US and uh, Russia and England had to agree their way was not going to be the highway. Their way was going the wrong way. And at the end of the day, we didn't agree on a permanent ban. We agreed on an indefinite moratorium. And this indefinite moratorium is very hard legally to ever get rid of, so I call it indefinite. Technically, in 2048, uh, somebody could stand up, some, some states, an Antarctic Treaty state could say, I'd like to review this clause. And they can do that. But uh, again, there will take consensus of the parties to return to the minerals negotiation and adopt the new minerals regime. But personally, although I won't be here in 2048, uh, I, I feel reasonably secure about that going forward. So looking ahead, what we want to see is the inspiration uh, which the Madrid Pro Protocol represents and which it has triggered. We want to have that help inform aspirations, big aspirations, just like the big aspiration we had in the 80s to protect Antarctica as a whole. Today we have protecting large parts of the ocean, the high seas, on the table. You're going to hear more about that from other speakers here. Uh, that's crucial. Um, just like in Antarctica, 
there are miners and drillers who want to go out into the open ocean. Um, and there's a, another thing, another treaty called the Law of the Sea Convention, which allows at present under certain conditions, deep sea mining. Well, just a few weeks ago in France at the IUCN uh, triannual conference, they passed a resolution. Spain helped support that resolution, which I congratulate Spain for. Um, and it, what does it say? It says, let's have a moratorium on deep sea mining in the high seas. So there's a lot of aspirational things that we can all do together to build on uh, what was achieved with Madrid. And it's an ongoing struggle. But if you don't struggle, you won't get there. Those are my, my words. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jim. That's very inspiring. Always good to remind, remember the old days as well and, and look in the rear view mirror and also in the wind, in the in the front uh, as uh, and at the same time. You mentioned the, the petition we did with uh, Jacques-Yves Cousteau, actually, as an aside and a little anecdote. I think that was the first ever electronic uh, petition that was developed in France. France, Pascal will remember, had this funny thing called the Minitel, which yeah. was like hey, a, an an <laughs> ancestor to the internet. And uh, with Jacques Cousteau, we, we launched that uh, electronic petition, which was really a, a first that did not exist anywhere else in the world. And uh, that was quite successful. Um, so, um, the conference on Monday is, uh, is in many ways a tribute to uh, those who made uh, Antarctic, uh, Antarctica protection uh, a possibility uh, 30 years ago, and Jim amongst, amongst them. So um, um, looking ahead, uh, we have uh, with us uh, someone who's who became, uh, who has become an Antarctic uh, advocate more recently than, than Jim, that's uh, Pascal, Pascal Lamy, as I said, a former uh, director general of the World Trade Organization. Uh, <coughs> we worked together a few years ago at the, uh, in the Global Ocean Commission, and, and now you co-chair Antarctica 2020. So uh, Pascal, a lot of people are wondering how uh, someone can move from being a, a, a free trade guru, if, if I may say, uh, to an Antarctic uh, conservation advocate? Well, uh, I, think I, can make, I, I, I think I have to make my case. Uh, to start with, um, I'm benefiting from the presence in this room of Paul Polman who can witness, I'm not a guru of free trade, I'm a guru of open trade. And there is a difference. And I'm sure Paul can explain why there is a difference. Now, I'll answer your question. Uh, it's, uh, the answer to your question is uh, why I'm here today is the result of a uh, 55 years long love story. Uh, which started uh, when I was uh, 20 years old and I fell in love with the women. And this woman took a job uh, in a university not far from a big military harbor in the south of coast of France, which is called Toulon. And I then had to do my uh, military duty. So I chose to become a Navy officer because I wanted to be based in Toulon. And then I became a midship, and I passed my exams, and then I was a navigating officer, uh, uh, navigating during uh, one year on a ship in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Atlantic. And then I fell in love with the ocean, which I think you cannot really not do if you spend one year <laughs> navigating as, a, as an officer. Uh, so that was the sort of second uh, start. Uh, then uh, I moved into uh, public service at my uh, national level, then at European level, and I became sort of 
expert uh, trade, globalization, uh, and the ocean is everywhere. When you talk, manage, try to harness globalization, not least because 90% of world trade is transported by sea. That uh, then uh, entertained uh, this uh, connection. And then I started wondering, uh, maybe there's something uh, I could do uh, in order to reverse uh, this incredibly rapid uh, degradation of our <laughs> ocean and water systems, uh, including in uh, this formidable contribution the ocean has on uh, fixing at least part of the climate and uh, biodiversity uh, degradation. So this led me, uh, when I was European Trade Commissioner, uh, to obtain from the members of the WTO to have disciplines in the WTO about fishery subsidies, uh, which was the only thing I could really do within my area of expertise. <coughs> that was uh, 20 years ago. So you're, you're lucky, uh, Jim, uh, to have done your Madrid Protocol uh, in a few years. Uh, after 20 years, we still do not have proper <laughs> Uh, fishery subsidies in WTO. There's a bit of hope uh, for the next material conference. Then this led me uh, to become a member of the Global Ocean Commission, uh, which uh, Remy uh, supported at the time, and which, uh, together with friends who were members of this Global Ocean Commission, we sort of midwifed the SDG 14. I mean, the SDG 14 <coughs> would not probably have seen uh, the light of day without the support and the advocacy of the uh, Global uh, Ocean Commission. And then when I retired from uh, the WTO, uh, I stepped in joining this Antarctica 2020 coalition, uh, which is precisely about surrounding the Antarctica continent with marine protected areas. I'm not going to explain here why we need to do that, I think everybody in this room uh, has a clear notion of the extreme importance of this place in the ocean for the whole of the ocean and the whole of the planet because of where it is, because of the uh, circumpolar currents, because of the food and the organism that live there and that are depleted with the melting of the ice and with the softening of the waters. Uh, Jim knows uh, and Emil know better than I do. Antarctica is the place where you have 90% of the ice of the planet and 70% of the water of the planet. Fresh water. Absolutely, yeah. fresh water. The problem being, as you know, that this fresh water is now melting. <clears throat> the ice is melting and it's uh, softening uh, the water. Then uh, you become the chair of the Paris Peace Forum, uh, which is another sort of love story with global governance, which, by the way, supports, and it did it in its first edition in 2018, uh, Antarctica 2020, as a major global initiative. Then you become the leader of a starfish mission in Brussels, uh, which was launched last week by the Commission, the purpose, which is a great sort of Apollo-like plan, uh, the purpose of which is to regenerate the European hydrosphere by 2030. So clean it by 2030. Ocean, seas, rivers, lakes, a formidable endeavor, uh, but with a lot now of support and uh, resources. Uh, so, and then you come to Madrid uh, to be with friends of the ocean, with people who love the ocean, and my own life experience is that you cannot love the ocean without loving the Antarctic. And this is why I think what we all have in common is passion. And I hope, I hope that, you know, it took 30 years from uh, 1961 to 1991 to get the protocol. We are 30 years from the protocol. And if 2021 could be the landing zone of a decision by Kamla on protecting the surrounding of the Antarctic, that would be the end of a second year cycle. Remember, we only have a 10 year cycle to get to where we want to be, which is protecting 30% of the ocean in 2030. 
if you don't do that starting with the surrounding waters of the Antarctic, which is 4 million square kilometers, we will never get to the 2030 target. So we still have to campaign a lot. Thank you, uh, Pascal. <laughs> certainly, certainly the uh, proposal to create uh, uh, a network of uh, marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean will be uh, at the center of the discussions at the conference on Monday. Um, I can witness, if I may, also that it's true that uh, you know what you're talking about when it comes to uh, boats and, uh, and the ocean. A little anecdote, exactly 20 years ago, I was still the political director of uh, Greenpeace International and I brought the Rainbow Warrior to Doha, you remember, and I organized your visit on the Rainbow Warrior. And normally you were the EU commissioner for trade. And normally when a minister come, <coughs> used to come on the Rainbow Warrior, well, they would do a photo on the deck and, and bugger off. Uh, there was also some ministers who would come out of curiosity, but they would say, no photos, no photos. And uh, you stayed for quite a long time and you had, I remember on the deck of the Rainbow Warrior, even maybe we went to the engine room, I'm not sure. Uh, you really had very uh, opportune uh, questions about seamanship and, and so on. You know what? you definitely know what you're talking about. So uh, marine protected areas, there is another organization that works in tandem with Antarctica 2020 and with ASOC, that's the Pew Charitable Trust. I'm never, as a Frenchman, I'm never exactly quite sure what to make of this uh, adjective charitable, but thank you uh, for your charity. Um, you, so as I said, you, you're a large organization uh, with a, a significant portfolio on, on marine, uh, marine conservation and especially your, you have a, an Antarctic uh, uh, element, also high seas where we have a, a Jackson, uh, Julian Jackson, sorry, who, who, who works on your high seas project as well. So. Um, uh, Emil, uh, how do you combine your work uh, with that of uh, Pascal and Antarctica 2020 and that of Jim and, and ASOC? Thank you, Remy. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, um, and I, I mean, I've, I'm probably I'm in the most difficult spot right now to speak after such distinguished, passion and impressive uh, people and personalities. Um, but <laughs> I'm afraid to uh, to be a little bit boring, but but I will answer start by answering directly your question, Remy. So um, indeed, Pew it, it's a large um, organization, American one, uh, and it's called charitable because it's a private money, private endowment, which is given mainly as charity to other people to implement the work, and that reflects in more or less in the approach how Pew works on different uh, uh, areas that it chooses as priorities. So half of the entire portfolio is environment, and in environment, the, the majority of the projects are focused on the H2O related activities. Oceans, seas, coastal areas, for example, um, I'm working in the project that is 100% focused only on the Southern Ocean protection, which includes MPAs, management of krill, which is the small crustaceans, critical for the, uh, for the biosphere over there but also climate change and, and uh, plastic pollution and, and other issues. But I also have uh, colleagues who work on the uh, Arctic uh, project or on the French Polynesia, or like Julian is working on the high seas and BBNJ issues. So it's a wide team, but why I'm saying that um, it's a dual approach, or as we mentioned, a tandem, is because Pew works partially with its own resources, but also, uh, there is this uh, habit of working in partnership, in tandems, in, uh, in close cooperation. And I could say that there are several uh, buckets or categories of people or organization that we work with. One would be the um, NGOs or the civil society, such as ASOC, uh, founded, represented, and still steered by, by Jim, and ASOC, including uh, several large environmental organizations such as WWF, Greenpeace, and two dozen more, I think, 
with, uh, with which we work on a daily basis. Uh, there is also the Ocean Unite, uh, Blue Nature Alliance, Sea Legacy. Uh, I, I, I mean, I don't want to list the whole uh, spectrum because otherwise I will offend somebody who I missed. Um, so that's the civil society uh, sector. We have daily interaction, weekly coordination calls, and, uh, and uh, several times a year even strategic alignment on what do we do for the next years and how do we divide and conquer, uh, uh, divide the tasks and conquer the, um, the governmental stakeholders. And governmental-wise, we are working from the top level, such as uh, presidents, uh, and thanks to Pascal, uh, we have uh, great access to to the French presidency, to the European uh, presidency, uh, but also uh, to, to leaders in, in Berlin, in, in Madrid, uh, and uh, in Washington. So if to give you us an impression of the scale, uh, it's from North America to Latin America, uh, from Southern Africa to, to Russia, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, China, basically the entire globe. Of course, we are focused on the countries that are represented in the CAMLAR, the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, which is the only uh, governing body of the Southern Ocean, the waters surrounding Antarctica. And we are mainly focused on the, uh, on the nations that are either active proponents of the MPAs or, and there are still two of them uh, which are blocking the, uh, the consensus decision, uh, which is Russia and China, trying to persuade them to change their mind, uh, trying on our own, uh, with our own resources, but also uh, relying heavily on, uh, uh, on Pascal and, and, and the Antarctica 2020 uh, team on, on the ASOC network and, and everybody else. And also it goes without saying that we have our own teams, but we also have thousands of scientists and, and experts that we are working with, uh, engaging with, but also funding their, their, their scientific research. So there's enough work only on the Southern Ocean to, to occupy hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, but the question is, and, and I'm often asked, especially by my own family and friends, why are you working on the, on the penguins on protecting this, uh, this nice uh, habitat uh, of, of the Southern Ocean? Uh, and I would say that it's as, as Pascal and as Jim and uh, as uh, Julia said, because it's critical uh, for the survival of the entire planet. It's a, it's a thermostat. Uh, it's, it's the source of, of food uh, for the entire uh, ocean. Um, but it's also um, important because that's the only place left on Earth where we still have a chance to prevent damage instead of repairing the irreparable damage that was committed by, by humans. It's enough for the, uh, for the Southern Ocean to suffer from the climate change, from the global warming, ice melting, uh, species migrating from warmer waters into the Antarctic and basically squeezing the inhabitants of Antarctica and not having enough resources. If you put on top of that the human uh, fishing activity and some, some other factors that we can control, then it's, it, it becomes like really a life and death decision, which we could, that death we could prevent. Uh, and at the moment, the only solution that is practical, feasible, and it's really a low hanging fruit is creating these large scale marine protected areas. Like was mentioned, three, tab uh, three proposals on the table, four million square kilometers, which is roughly the size of the continental Europe. Uh, two of those proposals, um, uh, one of them is sponsored by the, uh, Argentina and Chile, and two of them, it's by more than two-thirds of the CAMLAR members, led by the European Union and its member states, US, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, and um, now India, Korea, um, and even Ukraine. Um, and <clears throat> that decision has been already prepared scientifically and technically past the necessary screenings, and now depends only on the decision of two human beings on this planet, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. So now the name of the game is to, how do we make the best use of the upcoming uh, major uh, COPs that, that are in front of us in Glasgow, in Kuming and, and the other opportunities to persuade those two leaders to set aside the geopolitical games and, and all the uh, 
zero sum gaming and actually take a bold decision as it was taken 60 years ago with the Antarctic Treaty, 30 years ago with the Madrid Protocol. So maybe keep this 30 years pace and this year designate those MPAs because they are critical, as, as it was said, they are critical for achieving the SDG goals because of their sheer size. They are sustainable development goal. Correct. Sure. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, <laughs> goal 14.5, uh, to be precise. <laughs> Uh, but also they are critical not only for achieving goals, protecting the biodiversity and everything else. They are also critical for the politicians themselves, because otherwise, how can we trust and believe in all the commitments and pledges and promises and not all the papers that are being signed and different high-level forums if they cannot take a simple decision on creating these NPAs, which have been already pre-made and have been staying like in a prefabricated stage for years it's not that they are still need to work on them no it's just say yes that's it you go and that's why we're very happy to have this big network of people working on this thank you very much. thank you very much uh, thank you for a compelling uh, uh, statement uh, there are in in the room uh, members of uh, Spanish civil society, Spanish NGOs. In particular, I'd like to uh, mention uh, Elena Pita, who is the director general of the uh, Biodiversity Foundation, La Fundación Biodiversidad of the uh, Ministry for the uh, Ecological Transition. And I see others, I see Mario Rodriguez. I think there is Pila, uh, with your mask, I you know, you're hidden behind your mask, but Pilar uh, is from Greenpeace, Spain. There are others, obviously. Uh, I'm sure they'll be interested in interacting with you uh, uh, in those days when you are uh, in Madrid. It's, it's a great opportunity. Uh, one, so obviously Antarctica has many friends, may, maybe more friends, than 30 years ago, because we know much more about Antarctica uh, and its, its planetary uh, role, and there is more information and so forth. But however, I have the impression that uh, it, it's, it's more difficult nowadays to uh, get international agreements, as was alluded to uh, by by Emile than it was 30 years ago. Like 30 years ago, it took three years of negotiations, intense negotiation, of course, but just three years to uh, protect the uh, Antarctic con continent. Whereas it's been at least five years, probably more, uh, since the discussions have taken place about the creation of this uh, uh, network of uh, marine protected areas around the, in the waters surrounding Antarctica, and only one or two, two. well, it, two, but essentially one, the big one, big one uh, <laughs> ha has been adopted. Yes. So that's really a paradox, no? And how, what's your reading, Jim? Well, my reading includes two things. One is that Although it only took two and a half years to negotiate the protocol, it took almost nine years to kill the Minerals Convention to lay the foundation for the protocol. Uh, still, it was a marvelous accomplishment to pull that off in two years. And I think part of the reason we could do it is at that moment, the governments were afraid. They were afraid of the United Nations where we had launched this huge question of Antarctica going on every year there. Uh, still a very small group of countries that led the Antarctic Treaty then. So that was one key factor. But I'd just like to hearken back to another time in history when the world community did roll up its sleeves. In the 50s, there was beginning to be military activities in the Antarctic. And although it was widely used for science of one sort or another, there was out of control fishing going on. Uh, there were geopolitical interests that were seven claimants and all the rest of the country said, no, we don't agree with that. And there can't be any territorial sovereignty, et cetera. And to his great credit, President Eisenhower in 1957, uh, working with his brother, who was a scientific guy, president of the university, 
gathered this brain trust of people from all over the world and they, they took a look for the first time as a global community thing and said, let's do something. And in less than three years then, they negotiated the Antarctic Treaty itself, which put on ice forever, really, uh, the claims. So we have that thing to draw on as well. Today, our big problem, I think, Remy, is this, simply this. Democratic society can do a lot in countries where democratic society can work. Unfortunately, China and Russia are not two of those countries. And uh, we've tried, uh, Pascal can tell you many stories of everything we've tried in the last two years to get through to top, top people uh, when, in Russia and China. Uh, but as of yet, uh, they're intransigent. And so I don't have much to offer, except we can't give up. But that's my little backstory on where we are. So uh, thank you for that uh, history perspective. Pascal, you've been in government. You've been a trade minister in France. You've been an EU commissioner, let alone running the World Trade Organization. So what's, what's your... Uh, What's your advice and what, what do you have to add to what uh, Jim is saying about, about the uh, blockage? Well, I, I would agree that it's probably more difficult now than 30 years ago. Uh, and I think there are two main reasons for that. First, there are more vested interests in fishing around the Antarctica today than 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Yeah. Few, 30 years ago, there were a few fishing boats. <laughs> the, the order of magnitude of the economic challenge was sort of $100 million. <clears throat> today, when you look at who's fishing down there in Russia and in China, the order of magnitude of the economic interest is probably to the tune of $3 billion. And that makes a big difference because these lobbies have a great influence on the president of Russia and on the president of China. And they have to, in a way, overcome a domestic lobby. Not that they can't do that, they're not exactly democracies that you know, work with a lot of uh, compromise, but it's in a way the, the political price to pay to get there is higher. Now, then on the other side, it's clear that global governance is not in, is in bad shape. Now, the, the, the peak of, of, of the improvement in global governance is around 1994, 1995 when the WTO was created and when the International Criminal Court was created. Those, that was the peak of a movement that started after the Second World War and that developed for political and economic reasons, including globalization. So on the one side, it's more difficult. On the other side, the capacity to do it together is less. So I think this is, this is the fundamental model. Now, how can you uh, address this? First, I think we really have to reach out to uh, Mr. Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, who may also, and that may be a second or third factor, we are nearing this 2048 horizon. It's nearer to us than it was when it was created. And maybe some of these people are starting to say, oh, how am I going to play my hand mm -hmm. in uh, 2048? And, you know, 10 years before, people will start, and this is 2038, and we're not, we're not that far from that. So I believe what we have to do is run uh, our, our action on two streams, one reason, and another, which is emotion. And I saw that in running this, in preparing this selfish mission in Brussels. We have still a serious problem in bringing public opinion in love with the ocean. In many areas, it's still distant, deep, dark, dangerous, uh, including in, in coastal populations. So I think the emotional road 
is also the one to go, which is why what you're doing, Francesca and Julia here, is important. Not because this will exactly convince Mr. Putin or Mr. Xi Jinping, but it might raise emotions in the system that then, with ways which we have to organize, and I, I totally agree that I mean, Pew is doing a fantastic job for a long time. They were also supporting the Global Ocean Commission at the time. I think, I mean, if, if more waves of emotion can be created in different places, and this is one, and this is why I think we are here on the occasion of this uh, celebration of the protocol, it will help. Thank you, Pascal. You You, you have all been very good because according to the script that I prepared, it says Pascal finishes at 1.03 and Rémi says we have less than 30 minutes left uh, to have an interactive dialogue. And so you've really kept to the script. Uh, this is remarkable. Thank you very much. So as I said, we have 30, uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, we have to leave the room approximately at, at 1.30, although Elevio, the uh, director of the museum, uh, kindly told me that you know, there is a bit of tolerance there. Uh, there is a, mi a mobile microphone. Uh, if some of you in the room uh, would like to say uh, something or ask a question to the panelists. Uh, I'll ask you to be brief uh, and, and to the point um, and to introduce yourselves uh, before speaking. So there are people here that belong to different institutions. Uh, for example, I see Antonio Quesada who runs the Spanish uh, Polar uh, Committee. Um, it's you, right? It, it, you, you, have the same haircut, so maybe have a mix. Yes, it's you, sorry. I mean, we all uh, at the ages have uh, similar ha haircuts, right? Um, but, and, and there are others, um, and I know there are an, a number of Antarctic explorers. Maybe there is a, you know, some who have communicated to me through Twitter that they would be here. We would very much like to hear from them. We'll start with uh, Julian uh, Jackson, uh, who is also from Q, and uh, who would like to make some comments that I think are complementary to what we heard from, uh, from Emil earlier. So, Jackson. Oh. Uh, Julian, I said Jackson. Sorry. Jackson's quite a common name in the US, uh, but uh, not so in the UK. So Julian is good. Um, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for the inspiration. Uh, Julia, that's, that's amazing stuff. Um, actually bringing the scientists and making it real for everybody. And, and Jim, we've got a long way to go on all, all our ocean campaigning. So uh, that's really inspirational as well. Um, but to give us all a little bit of uh, inspiration, I just want to report that at the opening of the General Assembly of the UN in New York last month, it was announced that 100 countries, um, uh, including Spain, are now supporting the 30 by 30 initiative, um, which we've, we've definitely heard about. Um, so the idea of this is to get a new target agreed underneath the Convention on Biological Diversity at its 15th COP in Kunming, COVID permitting, next year, and that's to protect... 30% of the ocean space and the territorial space by 2030. In fact, Spain um, and a few others go a bit further. They are blue leaders, so they're calling for this 30% to really be meaningful and for these 30% to be highly and fully protected. Coming back to the Southern Oceans, if we can agree an MPA here, that'll be a massive head start to this campaign to actually start implementing it before these targets are actually agreed. As we've heard, the Southern Ocean isn't just important for the Southern Ocean's self sake, it's important for the sake of uh, the whole planet. Um, I was doing some reading before coming here and I read a research article that suggested that it provides up to three quarters of the nutrients for the whole ocean. Um, I could go into a long biological spill about how this is important, but I'll save that for another time. Um, we also, though, do need to protect the rest of the ocean and two thirds of that is um, that makes up half the surface of the planet are high seas. Um, so these are areas beyond national jurisdiction, and they currently lack the governance to put in place 
highly and fully protected marine areas. Less than 2% of that is currently protected at the moment. If you compare that with the areas that are under state control, that's about 7%. So we really need this new treaty to put in place these, um, these protections. And, and this treaty is being negotiated with one session coming up, uh, the final hopefully session coming up in March next year. But to my question, how do we ensure negotiators are truly ambitious uh, and they don't defer to the short-term economic interests, for example, fisheries and seabed mining, leaving this treaty powerless to do anything meaningful. I've heard recently that uh, politicians, when it comes to the climate, have been uh, treating the climate emergency as if it's a headache, when they should be treating it like a heart attack. Um, and I think the same is probably true, if not more so, for biodiversity. So if I can ask Jim and Pascal and, and others, how do we convince governments and their negotiators to give us a high seas treaty that is a defibrillator and not a packet of aspirin. Thank you. So maybe uh, Pascal, uh, who is the, uh, you know, who was in the Council of Ministers uh, for a number of years and in uh, also in the EU Council for a number of years, maybe uh, you should be the first to, uh, to answer that question because you have a, a view from inside and, and, and now also uh, of you from from the margins. Well, I mean, the good news is that there is a treaty in the making on the uh, BBNG that would address the problem which uh, Jim uh, mentioned about uh, protecting a, a number, uh, including uh, deep sea mining. Whereas for the moment, there's still uh, wide stitches in the net of disciplines on oceans. So that's the good news. The bad news is that uh, COVID uh, has killed uh, two years of negotiation. Uh, and that's a reality which we all have to know. You cannot negotiate on Zoom. Uh, there are lots of things you can do on Zoom, uh, but frankly, surely not negotiate. So we've lost two years. <clears throat> there is a sort of frustration that might become a sort of positive element. Uh, the problem will be, as always, to cut a compromise uh, because those who say nothing other than total protection, <laughs> and that's your story about protection and moratorium, or those who say, look, uh, we, we should stop halfway, uh, start something serious that don't ask me to agree to total protection. Uh, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it's exactly like trade unions negotiating with industry. Exactly. Uh, there is something you want. You've got good reason to do that. You've got a big constituency behind you who tells you, if you don't do that, uh, you won't be uh, the leader anymore. And you want to do that for very good reasons. And then you bump into another side who say, no, 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 no way. And then you try to find a compromise. And we all know that on both sides, the secret has always been to have the person that at some stage said, okay, let's cut the deal at this level. It might not be what we want, but it's going to be a step forward. And then we will move from there. And I think this is exactly the spirit which we need to sort of disseminate on this uh, negotiation. Like always, and very often on this planet, the, the, the problem will be on, uh, and, and it's, I'm not going to enter into technical details, uh, uh, but there is a, you know, a sort of big fight uh, whether uh, the ocean uh, is or not a common good and all the legal consequences of this, if you do something, whether harming it is something you will become responsible and liable for and so on. So it's horribly complex, but at the end of the day, it's a question, I think, of imagining, and we need a few people to do that. And the lady that runs the, uh, the, the negotiating group, uh, who's a Singaporean ambassador, is, in my view, very clever, and she probably will be able, and this is very important, to imagine the sort of compromise of the last minute that people can go back home saying, I want this, uh, or I did not, I wasn't obliged to do that. So I think this, this is the sort of cooking which, uh, which we now need. Technically, legally, scientifically, it's all clear. 
We just need the political capacity to cut the deal. Thank you, Pascal. A, a, a way to perhaps express or explain uh, uh, um, the importance of these uh, multilateral agreements is their frameworks, and they're like a chessboard. And so the, the agreement that is uh, under negotiation at the moment at the UN General Assembly on, on the conservation and sustainable use of, uh, of uh, marine biodiversity uh, in, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, that is to say the high seas, uh, let's consider it like a chess board. We need the chess board in order to move the pieces and at the moment, we don't have the chessboard, and that that's the problem. Um, and and hopefully, uh, with the collective effort and the momentum that exists, uh, despite the delays due to the COVID uh, crisis, soon we will have the the chessboard. So now, uh, uh, Marcus uh, Reiman uh, from TBA. 21, one of our hosts here. Uh, you have the microphone, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for all of the uh, explanations of the difficulties of international treaties, agreements, what we need, uh, where we should go. But as the starting point of this conversation is also the book. No, I have a question for you, Julia. In your kind of spatial analysis of the continent, uh, and bringing together all of these different uh, dif disciplines, thoughts, school of thoughts, and so on. Are there speculative avenues that are kind of emerging out of the book that are not being addressed here whilst thinking about chessboard and boxes and, and um, you know, international frameworks? Well, I guess what the, what the book does address, which was perhaps less um, discussed in this four at the moment, is, is really the, the human presence on the continent because what the, in the scientific chapters, let's say, or uh, aspect of the, uh, of the, the book sort of focuses very much on the, on the importance of the role of Southern Ocean and the marine protected areas and so forth. But perhaps it's the first time that it does a census of, of the evidence of our presence on the continent. And I think that is an interesting avenue to explore also projectively to understand how can we make sure that architecture in itself and our presence there is not used just again as a political device, but does lead towards an increased amount of scientific exploration that is done in the continent, really in the spirit of the treaty and of the protocol, which at the moment, I think, is not something we can say with confidence. So this does open up, I think, another realm of engagement that we should all collectively address, because it does aim towards the same or address the same challenge. Uh, and it, again, brings to the preservation of the continent. Thank you, Julia. With your permission, uh, um... Marcus, I'd like to, to, to say something that in the last couple of days, the, several of the panelists were sending me uh, emails saying, what's the dress code uh, at this event? And I said, well, Smart casual, but I would like you to stand up <laughs> and remove your uh, your glasses, the, not the glasses, the glasses. And and you know, I, he he's really he, he really is uh, <laughs> really is uh, smart smart casual, great great uh, t-shirt. Uh, so now you uh, have asked for the floor. Yes. So you introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Antonio Quesada. I am from the Spanish Polar Committee. And uh, I would like to, to have, uh, first of all, thank you all for, for being here. It's a great pleasure to have this panel here. It's a great, great pleasure. My question is about uh, our colleagues from China and Russia. I have the impression after this, as, uh, attending some of the meetings of the Antarctic Treaty and the um, Committee for, Antarctic, for Environmental Protection that in fact, MPAs and other protecting and conservation measures are excuses. There are big agendas behind, and this is not because of the fishing, because in fact, Russia is not fishing so much in Antarctica. 
is, is if you compare with other countries, it's not so much. China is not the case. But I believe, what, what do you think? Is, is this a part of a larger agenda behind or not? So that's a, an interesting question. Uh, I should say that Antonio uh, is going to be one of the moderators of uh, the first round tables uh, at the conference on, on Monday. And that's, that will be the round tables at which uh, Pascal, uh, you will be speaking. So, uh, and I've been uh, coordinating with Antonio uh, in the last uh, month uh, for the preparations of, of the different round tables and especially his. So uh, now the introduction is made. So that's a very good question that maybe uh, Jim, you would like to take up or yeah, maybe I, anyone else I'll around? Yeah. yeah, it's a good, a great question. And I think behind the minds of many, many of us who are involved in all these layers of negotiations over the years, uh, it's a common knowledge that, that uh, Russia and China in particular, uh, out of all the other member countries, seem to have a long-term vision of how to get what they can out of Antarctica, whether it's fish or down the road minerals and so forth. Whereas going back 30 years ago, many of the countries who were leading the effort to find oil and gas were countries like the US, the UK, the Netherlands, and so forth, you know. So that they've changed. They're not, they're, they, they're no longer thinking that this is a game that is worth playing. But apparently it seems like other countries, especially Russia and China, uh, think that game may still be worth uh, playing. And then as Pascal mentioned, although you'll read a lot of stuff in the newspapers and other places saying, oh, the protocol, the mining ban comes to an end in 2048. Nothing could be further from the truth. But in fact, it's the opening for a discussion should any member state or states uh, want to try to undo uh, the moratorium. So I'm pretty sure that the lawyers uh, for some of the countries are always thinking, you know, we really shouldn't give anything away. And that's how they look at it. They're not looking about the common good so far. And I don't think as a scientist, I know a lot of, I've known many of the scientists over the years from those countries. Uh, and still know several. And I think mostly they're really good-hearted scientists, they're honest scientists. But behind that are the politics and the politicians who are thinking about something else. And I also don't know how you, you have to use the emotion as Pascal was saying to get to Mr. Putin, get to Mr. Xi Jinping and so forth, yeah. uh, to, to push them in a different direction. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add something uh, or we take another question? There is a gentleman there who has asked for the floor. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Remy. I'm Andres Barbosa. Uh, I'm polar, a Spanish polar researcher and I'm a former uh, scientific manager of the Spanish polar program. And because we are in an in a art museum, I will uh, ask to Julia, because we know how science and, and policy and NGOs can also help to the protection of the Antarctica. But I uh, would like to, to ask uh, to Julia how the, the art can help for the protection of the Antarctica and in general for the protection of the nature. Well, I mean, what I believe is that we do have a responsibility when you're in the, in the world of arts or architecture to disseminate knowledge. And we have perhaps the, the ability to visualize and communicate important events which perhaps a scientist which is deep diving into their research has not the has not been taught or is not their sort of disciplinary sort of instinct to do so what we really see is one of the important sort of contributions hopefully of antarctic resolution and of the exhibitions and events that we're sort of curating around it is to bring greater awareness and to disseminate the knowledge in a way which can be accessible to a wider audience and this is why the this collective effort does not only we have many inverted commas, so it includes contributions such as Jim's and, and many other experts, but it really has also an apparatus of images, diagrams, infographics, cartographies that hopefully allow for legibility and visualizations of these problems and quantify them in the eyes of the general public, which is has less consciousness about Antarctica than it should. Uh, 
Uh, and, and that is where I see our role in the arts in the most uh, sort of widest sense of the term um, is, lies in this context. Thank you, Julia. I should uh, say that uh, Andres uh, Barbosa will be one of the panelists uh, on Monday. So uh, you will have opportunities to, to continue to exchange uh, with Andres. Thank you very much for uh, having uh, joined us here at relatively short notice uh, today on a Saturday. So now, uh, Elena Pita, I mentioned you were here. So you're the director of the uh, Fundación Biodiversidad. That's the Biodiversity Foundation of the Ministry for the uh, Ecological Transition. Uh, we've worked together on a number of occasions and it, it's, you're doing a, a remarkable uh, work uh, with civil society, with the private sector, with scientists, uh, and of course, with the public administrations in this country. So we would very much like to, to, to hear from you. Thank you for asking for the floor. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the panelists. There are so many interesting things that came up uh, during the discussion. During the discussion. Uh, but, well, just to... I don't think that's on, maybe. No, sorry. No, Do you want my mic? It's okay. Do you hear me now? Yes? No? No? Not too well. Ahora sí? Yeah. Sorry. Yes, now. 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 Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I promise it's not the first time I use a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was saying thank you very much for, for the different interesting things that came up this morning. And um, there are so many things to comment, but fortunately we have Monday to, to, to continue the discussion on this event. I just wanted to, to ask something that uh, I think was a, somehow a horizontal issue on all your four interventions. And it's somehow connected so, to something that also regards the, the work we do in the, in the Biodiversity Foundation. And it's related to how to communicate and how to, how to face in, in a context of uh, environmental crisis where the message from science is really uh, related to, to urgency and somehow depressing for, for citizens, how we really can communicate optimism. I was very, I, I agree very much on, in, in, the, in, the, in the lines of work that we developed this year in the Biodiversity Foundation. We really try to make this connection between reason and emotion because I think that what really moves people to action is somehow the sentiment more than the, the diagrams or the, or the data. But um, in Marseille, in the, in the IUCN Congress, it was also something that was mentioned in different discussions. How can we really uh, tr uh, move people to action and, and, and communicate optimism in the, in, in the framework of uh, well, difficult uh, scenarios that we, that we face? Thank you. Uh... Anyone would like to, 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 to answer this question? Just one word. Uh, in the case of biodiversity, I think we still have a big science gap. We don't really have it with the atmosphere. We don't really have it with climate. We have it with biodiversity. Uh, whether it's in uh, the water or whether it's on the soil. If you compare the amount of science that has appeared to public opinion, there is a gap which I think really needs to be filled. Now, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a scientist. They all recognize that there is an enormous unknown on how bio systems behave and influence each other. It's much more complex than physical or chemical interaction. And I think for the moment, that would be my, my answer to your question. Uh, we really, and I hope that Kunming and the preparation of Kunming and Kunming 
could go a, a long way in this direction. This is why, for instance, and I'm not speaking for uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, but he has uh, uh, taken the initiative of this ocean summit at the beginning of next year. This is why, for instance, as the leader of the Starfish mission, we are pushing for an international consensus on building a digital twin of the ocean. Uh, this is part of the Starfish mission. The EU will do it. I mean, there will be a few hundred million euros invested in building this digital twin uh, as far as Europe is concerned. Of course, we need a much wider, uh, and we have this uh, uh, decennia of the ocean science. Uh, we are working very closely with Robinin and his people uh, in, uh, in UNESCO. That, that would be my answer to your question. Let's try and use this window of opportunity we have in order to have a big science cooperation. And if we succeed in building this digital twin, we will win 30 or 40 years of oceanic research. And I've been talking to scientists on this, including on genomics, for instance. If, if there is a total difference between pursuing ocean, deep sea, deep water observations on the one side with these boats and these special robots that go down there and take samples, which is very slow and very costly, and building a parallel digital system in which you can make, make a lot of simulation of tests. And I think this, is, this would be the way to go. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, maybe for those who are not... Uh, as much in the weeds as uh, as us, uh, when you refer to the to Emmanuel Macron's uh, ocean summit, uh, this is something that he has announced uh, um, about a month ago uh, at the Congress of the IUCN. You know that Macron has organized uh, a series of uh, what were they called? One planet. The one planet, the one planet summit. So he's announced the one ocean summit. And let me say uh, that uh, the ambassador, uh, the French ambassador who is in charge of organizing this ocean summit will be here on Monday, uh, Olivier uh, Poivre d'Arvor. And he, he, he's confirmed to me uh, yesterday that he is uh, coming on Monday. So you might want to catch up uh, with him. Uh, I see uh, we're really getting to the end. So I see Marcus wants uh, to say uh, something, but on the issue of uh, optimism, with your permission, I'd like to add something. I often, uh, you know, when I introduce myself, I, I often say, well, I've been a, an environmental advocate and an ocean advocate all my adult life. So when you look at the trends uh, in the ocean and on the planet, you must think that uh, I really did a shit job, right? <laughs> uh, and when I say that, I say, but not, it's not quite true uh, because the reality is that if we collectively had not been around all those years, and in my case, you know, this 65 year old man started practically at the age of Greta. Um, if we had not been around, the situation would be much worse, uh, much worse. And uh, this is on the one hand uh, a cause for concern, but also it's a, it's, it's a cause for optimism because that's the optimism of action. So maybe as a last speaker, uh, Marcus, and then I'll... So um, I get up again. Huh? First of all, congratulations on, on all of these actions for so many years that lead to a co cause of optimism, no? But uh, yeah. I think to say about optimism, no? In a, in a time where very few countries actually deliver on their environmental um, uh, uh, commitments to communicate optimism is dangerous. No, I, I think we need to demand to become, be able to become optimistic, mm -hmm. but uh, to now communicate optimism is dangerous. Um, going back to something that Pascal 
alluded to is the deep sea. And, and Emil, I think you said it, uh, Antarctica being the one continent that hasn't been exploited yet. I think the deep seabed is another one. No, And so this is a tangential question, but leading into the future. As you said, I think it took three years to, to ratify or come to the uh, Madrid Protocol. No, Now Nauru has triggered the two-year role. A rule at the International Seabed Authority, meaning what they will start mining with the metals company within two years, no matter what the environmental code is that the International Seabed Authority comes to. Right? What can we learn from these three years that you've had to come up with a Madrid protocol? And what can we copy and paste over to the International Seabed Authority to protect the deep sea? Well, very, very briefly, um, you need a campaign. And you have to have leaders at the International Seabed Authority who are prepared to put aside short-term interests in favor of the longer-term interests and get this moratorium. And that's the whole guts of the IUCN resolution from a few weeks ago. But as we talk, there is no campaign going on. And uh, if there's not one mounted pretty soon, uh, then you're right. They will just use the legal mechanism of the agreement uh, and, and miners will start lining up to explore and eventually exploit. It's out of sight, out of mind, and how to make a how to shine a huge spotlight on it is the key question. I don't have a, an abundance of answers, and I'm too old to start a campaign. But um, <laughs> you know, but that's where we are. So. Yeah, that's the new frontier. Yeah. And uh, bear it in mind. And it's encouraging that. Uh, Spain did vote in favor of uh, the moratorium at the uh, uh, World Conservation Congress in Marseille last month. So uh, thank you very much for a very exciting conversation. Uh, Francesca, I know you don't like me to put you on the spot, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I first thank you again for uh, providing the platform, the opportunity for this uh, rich con uh, conversation. And maybe uh, you will let me ask you a question. Is there anything that you heard this morning that uh, leaves out something important in your opinion? <laughs> My knees are... Well, um, I think the fact that Pascal Lamy addressed and did bring towards us the value and importance that art and culture plays towards this not only dissemination or awareness raising, but the fact that we can provoke this kind of incredible conversation in a cultural space in the National Museum with a wonderful exhibition and a publication people around us from the art world that also have joined us in the room, not only scientists, uh, great thinkers, great creators, um, come together and have this type of conversation and that the arts and culture can have this type of role. I'm very, very honored that Pascal actually focused that uh, part of his talk on that because I, we definitely want to raise to the occasion and the TBA 21 Academy dedicated to the ocean we have a very strong campaign against uh, deep sea bed mining. And we have been doing that for the last seven years, actually. And, um, you know, it's very important that the art world be heard and be present um, in these great gatherings and meetings. So thank you very much for including us. And we're very happy and very uh, overjoyed to have such an incredible uh, and powerful conversation in a cultural institution. So thank you, Francesca, that was great. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. It's, uh, you know, remarkable that you, you uh, decided to, to spend uh, your Saturday, uh, a, a sunny Saturday uh, morning uh, to discuss Antarctica here. Thank you very much, Evelio, the director of the uh, Thyssen Born Nemisa uh, Museum, for uh, hosting us, welcoming us. Thank you, Carlos Uros, from uh, the director of the TBA 21 Foundation. And thank you to the rest of your team who has been uh, 
very active, helping us putting this together at a fairly short notice. Um, so thank you. We're very grateful to, to you. Um, Monday, uh, the day of the 30th anniversary of the Madrid Protocol, please, on Monday, remember that if there is Antarctica and a living global ocean to fight for, it is thanks to environmental advocates like you, like you, like all of us. And as I said, the environmental trends are not good, but without a collective action, it would be much worse. So let's continue the battle, stay safe, and keep the ocean safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.